a dead person can't sin, and Jesus represented you and me on the cross, and as far as a dead person is concerned, there's no ability to sin, nor is there a record kept of sin. We died to the sin, Paul says in Romans 6, 2. How can we live in the influence of the sin master when we're no longer even under the sin master? Doesn't it say that in Romans 6, 14? Doesn't he say in Romans 6, 14? You know, sin will no longer be master over us because we're not under law. Why aren't we under law? Because the law was fulfilled on our behalf and killed us. Galatians 2.19 says the same thing. If, if I have an opportunity shortly to elaborate on Galatians 2.19, I'll put it up here for the sake of reminder to later mention something about Galatians 2.19, which is about the aspect of the cross that involves the law, when he says in Galatians 2.19, through law I died, the principle being that the reason that the cross event occurred is because the fulfillment of the law was carried out to pronounce not only death on the human race in the Garden of Eden, but to fulfill that death penalty on the cross so that through the laws demanding that a sinner must die, then the law got fulfilled when Christ represented the sinner, not himself, but the sinner, and died on behalf of the sinner, then the law was carried out. The law was fulfilled. And once the law has been fulfilled and the law has killed the guilty party, then the guilty party is no longer under the law because the law put them to death. It's, it's interesting that it says the same thing in Romans 7 verse 1 because in Romans 7 verse 1, the question is raised, well, don't you know that the law only has authority over a person that's living? You know, how does he phrase that in Romans 7, 1? Don't you know that the law only has authority over a person as long as he lives? Suggesting that the law has no authority over a person once that they died. And in Romans 6, 14, why is it in Romans 6, 14 that sin will not be master over us? Notice, notice in the Greek that in Romans 6, 14, sin is used generically and it's not in the Greek, the sin, referring to the specific act in the Garden of Eden of forbidden fruit, but sin as a principle is ruling over the individual's life in the 21st century, and, and it's somebody's issue with sin in this way, somebody's issue with sin in that way, because it's the principle of sin governing an individual's life. Well, in Romans 6, 14, it says, sin will not be master over us. Why? We're not under law. Well, how do we get out from under the law? Well, the law assigned us to the cross. And Jesus, on our behalf, took the death penalty that would be credited to us because he didn't die on his own behalf as if the credit would go on his account. He died on our behalf to absolutely put the credit on the account of the sinner so that the sinner has not only died to the sin, but the sinner has also died to the law. And in Romans 6.14, sin will not be master over us because we're not under law, but we're under grace. Grace here in Romans 6.14 is a power, namely a figure of the power of Jesus that, that by nature does not sin. So when we're living by the life of Jesus, because we're not living by our own efforts anymore, because we died to the law, so it's no longer a mentality of I'm trying to serve God in the religious flesh, then the nature of Jesus is not going to sin. Grace means that we won't even experience the daily sin issue if we're living under grace and not under the law mindset. But human beings tend to live under the law mindset, not under a grace mindset, so human beings like Bob Bu continue to make the original trespass something that extends into the 21st century because I keep falling short of the glory of God. I keep living under the law mindset and law is something that in one scripture in 1 Corinthians, you know, actually empowers the principle of sin. You know, remember that in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 56, where the statement is made that sin derives its power from the law. And so if you have this law 
that is in the mindset of the individual, then they're going to find themselves having a bigger issue with sin than if they didn't even have a law of consciousness to begin with. We find that in Romans chapter 7. You know, when he says, I was alive apart from law, but when the commandment came, sin sprang to life. Why? Because his eyes were no longer on Jesus. His eyes were on himself to try to perform for God, and the law was measuring his success, or in this case, lack of success, and he ended up being so frustrated, he said at the end of Romans 7, particularly Romans 7, 24, wretched man that I am, who will rescue me from this body of death? And then of course he says, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Well, the, when the focus gets back on Jesus Christ our Lord, then the focus gets back on grace, and when the focus gets back on grace, and not us being under law, but being under grace, then the dynamic of Romans 6.14 is that sin isn't our master. Because sin won't be master over you, because in Romans 6.14 you're not under law, you're under grace. But how this relates to the discussion in the opening verses of Romans 6 is that the principle of grace is that none of us deserved to have Jesus go to the cross and fulfill the death penalty that was on everyone for being represented negatively by Adam in the garden. So, you know, nobody deserved what Romans 5.15 refers to on the positive side of the coin. Remember Romans 5.15 had first been, you know, discussed by myself as the many, interpreted as the many nations, put the death sentence on everyone. So that the trespass caused the death of the many nations, caused in the past tense the death of the many nations. From God's point of view, it already was a sentence of death on everybody from the Garden of Eden on. Well, as far as Romans 5.15 is concerned, the beginning of the statement in Romans 5.15 is the gift, which reminds us of the grace that we've been talking about in Romans 6.14. You know, because of grace, sin has lost power, all power, because sin can't live in relationship to grace, sin can only live in relationship to law. And he says in Romans 6, 14, sin is not master of us because we're not under law, but we're under grace. Okay, but when we had been speaking about Romans 5, 15, the gift is not like the trespass. Well, everyone got credit for the trespass because Adam acted on behalf of all his descendants. Well, the gift that Romans 5.15 is speaking of is Jesus acting on behalf of all Adam's descendants. And when it says in Romans 5.15, the gift is not like the trespass, what this means is that the gift is utterly good news and the trespass would be utterly bad news. But it goes on to say in Romans 5.15 that if the many nations got the death sentence, because of the trespass of the one man, how much more the grace of God and the gift, notice the past tense is going to be used in Romans 5, 15 for the gift, the gift that came, notice the past tense, the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ. The gift that came, already came now, by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, has overflowed, NIV, has overflowed to the many nations. The grace has overflowed to the many nations. Well, why is it grace? Because nobody deserved to have Jesus go to the cross and say, I'm treating my death as your death. And therefore, the sentence of death that's on you for the original sin in Adam is now eliminated from your account because I've died on your behalf, I've resurrected on your behalf, so now there's no record of sin for anybody in the mind of God because Jesus died on behalf of all people and therefore all people died, all people got credit for the fulfillment of the death sentence that was on them from the Garden of Eden on, and now Jesus has resurrected on behalf of the same people that he died on behalf of. We get that from 2 Corinthians 5, verse 15, and everybody should live not for self, but for him who died on behalf of them. And at the end of Romans, well, I want to say 2 Corinthians 5, 
at the end of 2 Corinthians 5.15, it says he not only died on behalf of everybody, but he resurrected on behalf of everybody. So altogether, 2 Corinthians 5.15, everyone is told to live for him, not for self, because he died on behalf of them in context of his statement, they died on behalf of all people, and therefore all people died. Next verse, which is 15, and he died on behalf of all people so that those who live should no longer live for self, but live for him who died on behalf of them and resurrected on behalf of them, which means that indeed, it's true that Jesus established a grace relationship with the Father God on behalf of everybody because he resurrected because of his righteousness and now his righteousness is called in Romans 5.17 the gift of the righteousness. Which righteousness in Romans 5.21 issues in this life Ionios that is the absolute eventual experience in full not just a taste of the powers of the coming age in Hebrews 6, 5, but the actual full-blown experience for everyone, everyone on the planet is going to experience the life that is of the messianic